So the first phase of secondary sex development is this right here, whether the Wolfian duck or the malarian duck survives. Those are a direct result of what hormones are secreted by either the testes or the ovaries, respectively. Okay. Now, there is another region called the genitor, uh, genital tubercle um, that will either become the clitoris in females or the penis in males. So this, again, comes as a result in initial secondary sex development as a result of these hormones uh, being secreted by either the testes or the ovaries. Then we have the labiosclerotal folds that can go either way too. It's called labio because it could become the labia in females or scrotal because it becomes scrotums in males. So the derivative, the labiosclerotal folds can become either one depending upon what hormones are being secreted by the testes or the ovaries. Okay? So that is where their ultimate derivatives, the genital tubercle and the labiosclerotal folds, these, like the gonads, have the potential to go either way. In fact, in some situations, they've found that um, in some slight genetic abnormalities, certain individuals were born and appeared to be female because they saw what looked like a clitoris that was extremely small, but when they reached the second uh, stage of secondary sex development or puberty and massive levels of testosterone were secreted, it actually enlarged and became a penis. That would be quite a day. Um, so that, it doesn't happen very often, but there are circumstances where that has happened where they've had that occur. Yeah. So one of the interesting things about estrogen Women have more estrogen circulating through their bloodstream than men do. However, estrogen is also in male sperm development. In fact, there are higher levels of estrogen around where the spermatogonium are developing than in, as far as concentration than in uh, women's blood. So men have estrogen too. Estrogen is needed not, uh, uh, not just in women but also in men for various developmental processes. So it's not exclusive between the two in terms of women only have estrogen and men don't have any estrogen. So it's interesting because to develop our sperm, we need estrogen, high levels of it around those cells to be able to do so. All right. So here's the genital ridge. Here are some of the genes that will, uh, again, as we talked about, this is just the overall dynamics of both primary and secondary. So we talked about primary, that's the ovaries or the testes. We went through a lot of those uh, um, genes and such. If they're ovaries, remember that these stem cells will become granulosa and fecal cells, which then turn into the follicles that will secrete estrogen around these oogonium, or they'll turn them into oogonium, and initiate meiosis. From there, the ovary will secrete estrogen that will cause the malarian duct to form into all of the components of the female. And then in testes, as testosterone is being secreted, it causes the Wolfian duct to survive. One of the things they've shown, too, is in the earliest stages of development, it's not just testosterone. In fact, it's, um, what is it, dihydro something testosterone. It's a, a different version of it that's, that actually initiates a lot of these changes in the, um, uh, to be able to form the male secondary sex characteristics like the scrotum and the penis and whatnot. So um, testosterone does play a key role in a lot of this, but there's also a, a derivative of it that plays even a, a more important role they're showing now. All right, so let's talk about hermaphrodites and, because that's always a big question, even in my 1010 class, and I try to explain it to them the best I can. Whenever I talk about Klein-Filterson, they always ask that the first thing is, is that hermaphroditism? So let me explain how this works. On occasion, when crossing over a curse uh, during meiosis, you can possibly get a translocation of a part of the Y chromosome to the X chromosome. Now, if that X chromosome that has the uh, uh, male-producing genes are found um, and, and you have ultimately have an XX, so the X chromosome, this X chromosome that has sorry gene as well as maybe a couple other genes on it, um, fertilizes the egg, you would expect that the embryo would form as a female because of the two X chromosomes. However, remember that X, uh, 
chromosome inactivation occurs. And in the earliest stages, you not only have a double dose of X chromosomes uh, um, causing the cells to try, or the gonad to try to become an ovary, but you also have sorry genes causing genes to be turned on. So you have this conflict between whether or not the cells are going to become, uh, or the gonads going to become an ovary, or whether it's going to be testy. And two outcomes typically come about from this. In one scenario, there's enough genes uh, going in the between the two X chromosomes that one of the gonads becomes an ovary, and then the other one, it becomes a testy. So in that situation, you're going to have both an ovary and a testy, completely separate, but one of each. In other situations, you end up having a mosaic between the two. You've got an ovatesty, as they call it, which is essentially a combination of both ovary cells and testy cells. And what happens is, because of this, then you end up getting both the Wolfian duct and the malarian duct surviving, and you ultimately get uh, certain uh, um, things happening. In some situations, they can produce both a vagina and a penis, um, and this is ultimately where hermaphrodites come into play. You typically will not have both things like a uterus and, um, uh, and a prostate, but it really screws up these the, the uh, formation of the secondary sex characteristics as a result. Now, in other situations, we have what's called pseudo-hermaphroditism, which is not like hermaphrodites that have both uh, male and female secondary sex characteristics. Pseudo-hermaphroditism typically comes from a defect on the Y chromosome, in which case you would have what we call an androgen insensitive genetically male. It's XY, but it develops as a female. And the reason for that is because even though the Y chromosome is there, you do get testes developing, but you do not get testosterone ultimately, or you don't get the uh, cells being able to respond to the testosterone. As a result, the secondary sex characteristics are female. So you essentially have a female with all the secondary sex characteristics but with testes where the ovaries would be. So we call that pseudo-hermaphroditism because it's not actual hermaphroditism to have both male and female uh, um, uh, sex parts. So that's ultimately where hermaphroditism comes into play, uh, is a translocation typically of genes from the Y chromosome to the X. You have two X chromosomes with some Y chromosome genes and it causes these ovotestes to form, or one ovum and one testes to form. And due to the hormonal uh, differences between both of them, you get a mix between the, uh, what uh, differentiates between the Wolfian duct and the malarian duct. And in the end, they typically have both a vagina and a penis. These are now obviously in the second stage of uh, sex characteristics, this is where you get breast development or no breast development in males, or you get the, um, you start ovulating in females, you start producing sperm. Uh, at this point, when things really start kicking in, this is when the seminiferous tubules uh, in the male testes start hollowing out, and that's what causes the sperm to mature, and that's what, what uh, allows the sperm to start being able to be generated. In women, it's what's going to start ovulation of the oogonium that are already undergoing meiosis that's going to initiate these uh, hormonal changes. Obviously, other things start being affected because of the increase in these hormones, um, such as muscle mass or uh, other major features that make a difference between male and female. Now, one of the interesting things that's starting to find, too, is it's not just in these by potential gonad and these other regions that the X and the Y chromosomes come into play and those genes come into play. They're starting to find that these genes can actually come into play in neural development as well, that it affects certain regions in the brain and certain hormones and uh, dopamine receptors and things of that sort. Uh, they're seeing differences between male and female brains even before the by potential gonad becomes either the ovaries or the testes. So they are showing that these genes do play a role in the brain chemistry, and that makes sense because typically, not all the time, but typically, if you have male characteristics, 
then you feel and act like a male. There's a certain male behavior, as well as in female. And that brings us up to an interesting point, sexual identity. And this, obviously, there's a huge endeavor about this, and we're not even close to being able to address this. We've been able to do some experiments on things like Drosophila, where by changing a gene, you can cause males to try to mate with one another, and it's usually uh, pheromones or something of that nature. It's not as simple in humans, um, obviously, in that regard. And even it's fairly complex in Drosophila as well. But they are showing that genes do affect not only the sexual uh, characteristics, but the overall brain chemistry and overall identity. So here are the different levels. I just wanted to go through the different levels of sexual identity. Gonadal sex. This is, again, whether or not you have testes or ovaries. So this is the primary sex determination. But then, as we, as we just went over, as you know, then there's the phenotypic sex. This is what develops as far as your secondary sex characteristics. As we showed, you could have testes internally, but externally being entirely female uh, as a response to the lack or inability to respond to the hormones because of the, uh, a, a slight genetic defect. Okay, so the phenotypic sex typically matches the gonadal sex in when things don't go wrong. But these last few, these have more to do with the psychology. And this is why this is a very kind of, you know, we really don't understand much about it. We do know, this is what I was saying before, that the X and the Y chromosome do come into play in terms of how dopamine is secreted in the earliest stages of brain development and other things in terms of the neural connections. As such, we have two different levels of sexual identity. One's gender identity, which is essentially what gender do you feel like, okay? Most of the time, males feel like males and females feel like females, but there are individuals that have the male phenotype that feel like they actually should be a female and vice versa. Most time, people don't realize that there is this. Most of the time, they just look at the sexual orientation, which is what your attraction so whether or not you're attracted to the same sex or the opposite sex. But that's different than gender identity because there can be individuals that are male sex characteristics, feel like they're a female, but still be attracted to women and vice versa. Okay? So ultimately in development, we deal with what we can show quantitatively. This gets really into a lot of gray area. But it's still an area of interest for a lot of scientists and researchers because we have the norm and then you have things that are different than the norm, and we want to know, well, what causes that? What, what things, whether it's environmental, genetic, or both, I mean, we want to know how everything works.